Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Incubator booth at Neo Heart 2024. We are joined with um, the A team, uh, Dr. Nim Goldstrom and Dr. Tom Hayes. Uh, Tom, Nim, thank you for dropping by. Thank you for having us. I, I always feel more the B team, but uh, <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you guys for making the trip all yeah. the way to New York. I mean, to be it's, here been, with us. it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, something that has come up a lot about Neo Heart is the quality of the speakers and the people that are here and truly the multidisciplinary aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I forgot who we said this with, but it's it really isn't a conference where you get a group of neonatologists with varied interests. You, yeah. you get that, but you also get the experts in their respective field. Mm -hmm. You have people from the, the area of neurology, Terry Ender, for example. You had Camille Martin. You have people who um, you have people from the cardiac field, from the cardiac surgery field. So uh, radiologists, so everybody is here. That is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And 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 we learn so much from them. Like they, they talk to us about innovative approaches and you're like, I, I was not familiar with that. This is so incredible. The surgeon just stopped by and he's like, as you're aware. Did, yeah, and I was Aditya. like, I was not aware actually. So thank yeah. you. For Aditya was our previous me. guest. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. My God, what a brilliant man. We thank you for, uh, you know, that compliment we try to pride ourselves um on that model you know there and again not to take away from other conferences societies or ideas but um people who come down and spend their time to kind of hear about their field would want to see the edge of the field right the, yeah. the the speakers um who are pushing and learning and providing what is happening and what's going to be happening in the future and in this space right neonates preterm infants with the range of cardiovascular problems that we know they have, structural congenital heart disease, the hemodynamics of the PDA, the hypoxic ischemic uh, mm -hmm. term baby, CDH, which are all tangentially related to the cardiovascular system, right? right? It takes a team and it's a village of general surgeons and, and cardiac surgeons and cardiologists and neurologists. Um, and this is a space for that, right? Yeah. It's, it's a way that without bringing them in, you, you're, you're potentially just not getting the whole pie and if we're all dealing with these issues from our from our sandbox and from our place, mm. let's get together. Right? Let's talk about how are we all doing this to kind of lift up the child through this multidisciplinary approach. And the cardiovascular system just seems to be at one of those bridges, right, where we have an opportunity yeah. to bring everyone. And we're glad we can be a showcase and a society to anchor that for everybody year on year uh, and get those kind of people. And we're really blessed and honored to, to be able to do that. I mean, I'm especially intrigued by kind of two things you said. I think... Sometimes the the heart can be intimidating, or you say that's not kind of my, my, that's not my shtick, that's not what I do. But um, I think by being here and seeing the kind of diversity of topics, I mean, this is not just congenital heart disease either. Complex congenital heart disease. This is the day to day in the NICU because every baby has a, a heart and they're dealing with this, uh, you know, their their physiologic state, and 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 the heart is just such a huge component of that. And what I also especially liked is you said kind of how can we get people to the edge? How can we get people to innovate, really? Which is what we love to talk about on the podcast. But I think the only way we can push the field forward faster is by working together in kind of this multidisciplinary approach. You guys have made the point that um, we haven't had a big leap forward in neonatology since like surfactant. Yeah. Um, it, it, we've had a lot of uh, improvements in degree, but not really in kind of mm. care. Um, you know, surfactant, that was uh, basic scientists, pulmonologists, mm -hmm. um, people outside of our field working together. Uh, you know, hopefully these kinds of conversations that we're having here, um, whether it inspires somebody or connects people, um, that, that, that's the idea, right? I'm very interested to talk to you, Tom, about this because um, what I've, I'm fascinated by and what I'm taking away from NeoHeart is that it is one of the rare instances where a field that is in really a dynamic mm -hmm. flux prioritizes families and conversations about social determinants of health. This is something that people have talked about on the air uh, over the past uh, the past day or two. And and I think that's really impressive. You're moderating, moderating I'm sorry, a session um, this afternoon on family and communication. Can you tell us a little bit about when we want to achieve the best outcomes, this is a critical component of that care? Yeah, it's so hard. It's um, 
th- there's the art and there's there's the science. Mm-hmm. I I haven't seen a great way to turn it into science yet. Not to say that it shouldn't be. The people I've learned so much from and and how we have those conversations, um, th- th- they're masters of um, compassion, of listening, of of um, w- whether that's I. I worry how much of that is trainable versus just finding the right people and learning from um, from them with an open heart. Um, I'm hoping that the session today will uh, will, will cast light on ways that we can make it um, something that's teachable and uh, and and more in the science. Um, but it, to me, it's part of the art of medicine. That yeah. we, we we're not a scientific discipline; we're an applied science. Um, we, we take what we learn. And then we have to have these intensely human moments with families. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what makes that secret sauce, but uh, yeah. hopefully we'll get better at it. I think one of the things that is um, a component of that secret sauce is something that you may not anticipate from the community that we're meeting at NeoHeart in terms of how, ex- how, how many experts we have. But it is that humility. So many people mm. really are very vocal and humble and say, well, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. And and you wouldn't expect this because you would say, oh man, these are these are the leaders in the field. They yeah. they they know everything. And no, they 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 don't. And they are very open to say we we need to be honest about what we we know and share that with family and share with families also what where are the, our deficiencies in terms of research and current knowledge. I think that's yeah. that's to me was impressive. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm you know biased, but um, I would argue it's an ethos of neonatology, right? Mm. Living with uncertainty. Yeah. And I think. Um, part of what we train, part of what we try to model all the time is the uncertainty, even with better data to families, right? Model that for our trainees and as a group, just be comfortable with that degree of uncomfortability, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's neonatology. I, not to say that that's not like maybe end of life care or palliative care to adults who have, you know, terminal cancers and there's, there's unpredictability and uncertainty. <clears throat> just speaking for us, we we counsel that prenatally, right? You're, yeah. You might deliver a 24 weekers and here's the NICHD calculator and it could lead to a horrible bunch of bad outcomes. And I, and I don't know if they will, but it could. And, and feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable. And what we've been really blessed to see is that in this collaborative environment, modeling that has allowed other disciplines to feel okay with the yeah. uncertainty, right? Like, I don't know how your child will come out of this cardiac surgery and then have a surgeon say like it might go well and it might not right to, to not lean on hubris but to lean on we will try and this is the best we can do and you have to tell us as a family to the point of like conversation mm. and communication is this the kind of risk you want to take to your family mm-hmm. and you know to to lean on your points tom right like the art and the science of communication and information and working with families you know i i it's easy to look at hard things like hemodynamics and tools and stuff that can be taught and come in and give you an yeah. answer. And then it's like, nope, the heart's squeezing fine. Your blood pressure sucks because of your vascular tone. Start mm-hmm. some norepi or vaso. Um, but there are plenty of disciplines, and we're really um, excited about continuing to collaborate with the world of palliative care yeah. and ethics specialists about the not just the art but the science of there is a way and strategy to how to communicate with individuals right in 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 the questions and how you frame questions right mm-hmm. rather than coming in open questions versus very closed and fixed questions to be able to not just give people information but give it in a way that they can come to terms with the realities that we face right and so some families don't want certain things if the outcome we can tell them is your child may have a high degree of disabilities and even the road to that may not be something you want. Mm. And so we don't have to do those things, right? And I think there are ways of communication and we we want to explore that, right? And that's what these sessions are for is how to impart the skill sets of the house, right? That they can be done and there there is probably a science to it. And we want to learn from those experts in communication, right? Of how to do it for our families and our patients. I like kind of the the undertones. You know, I think actually families handle uncertainty better than the medical team does, better than we give them credit for. But I think what really frustrates parents are these transitions of care and going to different subspecialists and not, not everybody being on the same page. But it's the underpinning of the conference is not that we should be talking about this in closed rooms and conference rooms and lecture halls, but that we should be building teams at our local institutions that are collaborative. And I think that changes the experience uh, for families very much, regardless of the communication we use and regardless of our prenatal consultation, but um, being on the same page as a team 
you know, facilitating the transitions of care, I, I think can, can really change outcomes, but sp- specifically how parents experience um, their, their situation, which can be quite longitudinal. Um, the other thing I'm really taking away from this is um, we're realistic, but there's so much hope really about the excitement and, the, and new innovations that are happening in the cardiology, cardiology adjacent space here. So, Tom, I wanted to ask you that same question. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, there's a big Columbia presence and you guys are involved in neonatal cardiac care, but um, so knowing what you know, having listened to a, a few talks already, what are some of the things that you were impressed by and say, oh, I'm taking that back up the street <laughs> to uh, to my institution? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, there's a recency uh, bias. Uh, I'm just thinking about the some of the talks this morning. Nim and his mentioned um, including genetic data in these mm-hmm. large sets of, uh, the, we're trying to build large cohorts so we can really understand uh, the landscape of congenital heart disease and preemies especially. Um, and whether or not and how we include genetic data is such an important question to me. If you look at uh, these data sets, when they include um, patients from the last two decades, that's a very heterogeneous uh, group uh, as far as genetic testing. 20 years ago, that might have been a karyotype. A month ago, that might have been uh, a genome sequence. So it's, it's not just yes, no, are we including genetic data, but how are we including genetic data? And I think it also really implicates the need for prospective studies. Um, and then just you know, an innovation session I was helping to uh, moderate um, 20 minutes ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rita Higgins from Medtronic um, really just blew the top of my skull off about ha- um, objective data demonstrating the racial bias in uh, pulse oximetry. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was so cool to hear that from the industry, the, the things they're doing to educate us about it and to uh, to innovate ways to overcome that, um, specifically that uh, patients of color are not just getting um, a missing signal, but getting what looks like a good signal, but, that, mm. that, what, but there's a discrepancy between that signal and uh, a blood gas measurement. Not even reliable. Yeah, yeah misleading. Right. It, it was, um, th- those were two... Um, yeah, to, to me, great points. I'm happy to hear. I'm happy to hear about that because it's something that's coming up in other areas of of neonatology, especially with transcutaneous bilirubin monitors. Like, I'm, I mean, there've been some studies looking at that, trying to really make sure that we can get uh, accurate measurements for everyone. Um, and talking about this, I think this is a great segue for you, Nim, about um, the the session that uh, you moderated about uh, called AI is here, separating out fact, fiction, and feasibility. So, can you tell us a little bit about what? Tom was just mentioning and how critical that is as we are trying to implement artificial intelligence in our practice. Yeah. Um, you know, it, I guess it's not a spoiler alert because it already happened, mm-hmm. but we're, uh, it is also a, a bit of a nebulous terrain, AI in general. There, there are um, very specific things that are probably going to make their headway very, very soon. Um, and then the general things that are, 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 are proving to be more difficult to, um, land on. And the two perfect examples from that session was, you know, cardiac imaging, right? Having the AI help us with like more uh, acute diagnoses, better uh, stratification of images that, you know, cardiologists may have a hard time visualizing because of grainy pictures and poor windows. Um, And that has made leaps and bounds in the ability to get predictive value and high quality assessments. We're on the other side of things, right? having a complex patient in your ICU and figuring out when exactly are they going to arrest Mm -hmm. has been a very difficult thing to predict Mm -hmm. with probably even more data than what the imaging people have available Mm -hmm. to them. And so these are... That's interesting. Yeah, right? It it, it just shows you the the novelty of this field yet, right? It's evolving and the the tools are there, but the the problems right now with the state of of, um, AI and, and... not yet getting to what's called general AI that can be way more uh, robust around many problems and think like a human rather than being very specific, which is what these mm-hmm. cardiac imaging tools are and what, uh, what cardiac arrest are, which are specific AI that's not meant to be applied to other sciences, um, is proving itself to be problematic in five or 10 years when you have like general uh, AI systems that can kind of think uh, more flexibly, it might get solved. Um, but you know, we, we have to be very strategic because you, you don't want to use systems that are going to you know, create a completely different algorithm with, with outcomes that we can't really rely on mm. in our care. Do you think that it has to do with us trying to really retrofit a technology into our 
old fashioned way, like almost like uh, driving a plane on the highway type of situation where uh, you really could do other things, but you're, you're just not using it right. <laughs> Possibly. Uh -huh, I, it's, I, you know, like uh, we are also like risk averse, right? We're not going to all of a sudden like employ or, or change our practice. It's like, well, we don't need, uh, you know, uh, cuff BPs anymore because like we can do all this stuff from the AI and get it from the EKG signal and the area under the curve. It's like, well, let's, let's, can we do some research on that yeah. first and figure out that's going to work? And I think the public needs to hear that message specifically yeah. to understand that the, the people who are safeguarding medicine in general are not going to wholesale accept everything without test, yeah. try, testing it, uh, stress testing some of these uh, processes and make sure that the, the safety and the health of the patient is preserved. Yeah. So I think that's good. And so like, let's say an immediate area of impact you can see is, you know, hemodynamics, right? Mm -hmm. the, giving the tools to the neonatologists, training them in, in targeted neonatal echoes or point of care ultrasound is prime time, right? It, it, it should just be everyone who can get trained. That's just my bias. Uh, and we're so fortunate to have the hemodynamics community as part of NeoHeart, right? Because that's a clear tool for the preterm and term infants with cardiovascular instability. Marry that with these systems, right? That can help you make even more refined diagnoses by doing AI on your images, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have your TNE expert saying, I think you have myocardial dysfunction. I see that the, you know, the squeeze of the heart is, is poor. The LV output is not great. The SVC is false. And the AI system, because they're like, yeah, but also I think I'm seeing hemodynamics yeah. here. So maybe I you couldn't catch a window that mm -hmm. showed the duct where it is, right? That's a perfect marriage of a system that can be really well trained with an expert stuff to get even more utility, yeah. right, at the bedside. Yeah, that's, that's great. Nice. That's great. Tom Nim, thank you so much for dropping by and uh, wishing you a good rest of your conference and safe travels back home. Up the street. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, for those who uh, you know couldn't be here at the conference, a lot of these are going to be posted online. We're recording a lot of these sessions. Yes. Uh, many of them are live broadcast and live streamed now. Uh, and so for those who can't be here in person, uh, many of them will be available offline after the conference. And so we hope and, you guys enjoy them. And I'm hoping well. that some of these uh, snippets that we've recorded with some of these speakers are going to uh, drive people to listen to their full talks. Because some of the people that we had the privilege of speaking to have been phenomenal. Uh, Mary Mullen this morning was just yep. in incredible. So, yep. yeah. And then what are the best way for people to access that? Yeah, uh, the Neo Heart Society, neoheart.org, uh, is, the, is the main portal that you'll be able to get offline content, uh, pictures from this conference, get contact information from our speakers, uh, and get to see the, uh, the recorded sessions uh, from this conference and from conferences before as well. Awesome. Perfect. Thank All you, guys. Right, thank you both. Have a good rest of your day. This is fun. Thank you.